Okay, so we learned a lot of interesting things in the last video. We learned that the function e raised to the i omega t describes circular motion going around the complex plane with uh, in the counterclockwise direction, or circular motion with a frequency of positive omega. We also learned that the function e raised to the negative i omega t describes clockwise motion around the complex plane or motion with a frequency of negative omega. And we also learned two interesting things about the sine and cosine functions in the complex plane. We know that we can write cosine omega t is equal to e raised to the i omega t plus e to the negative i omega t all divided by 2 in sine omega t is equal to e raised to the i omega t whoops, minus e to the negative i omega t all divided by 2i. Now we had also said that in the last video that cosine omega t is the projection of like the circular motion along the real axis and sine omega t is the projection of the circular motion along the imaginary axis. Now, what I want to do first in this video is essentially relate those two ideas. Relate the idea that like cosine is this oscillation along the real axis, and then relate that to the idea that you can describe it with this equation here. What this equation here says that is that you can describe this oscillation along the real axis as a sum of rotation in one direction plus rotation in another direction. Now let's just do uh, like what just show graphically what I mean by that. Let's just say that we have this function e to the i omega t and e to the negative i omega t. And at time, let's just say at time t, e to the i omega t is right here and e to the negative i omega t is right here. And we want to try and find a way that we can like remain on the real axis. But the problem is when we rotate, we're going to go up and down, so we're going to have some imaginary component. And we want to do something with, with these two functions to try and remove that imaginary component and just stay on this real axis. And the best way we can do that is just by adding them together. And the best way to like visualize that is let's just like visualize a vector going from the origin to this point here, as well as a vector going from the origin to this point here. If we were to add these two together, think of it as like adding these two vectors together, and we would cancel out the imaginary components and would get back on the real axis. And maybe at a later time, like maybe, like let's just say uh, e to the i omega t is here and e to the negative i omega t is here. So you can think of this vector and this vector. And if we were to add the two together, we later get on this point right here. And eventually they may be both over here. And we can add these two vectors together and get like back on the real, whoops that vector, get back on the real axis here. So essentially, by adding these two like functions that describe circular motion, you're able to cancel out the imaginary component. So like this, uh, I shouldn't really say the y-axis component, but the dependent variable component, well, the imaginary component. You're able to cancel out that component, and we're able to stay along the real axis and we scale it by a factor of two, we divide it by two, so that uh, it remains between one, zero, and negative one, because otherwise it go from two to negative two. So we can see how like this cosine oscillation is just uh, a sum of two rotational like functions. You can do the same thing with sine omega t, Except that the key thing about sine omega t is that describes oscillation along the imaginary axis. So we can redraw 
our unit circle. Let's just say down here. So now let's say we have these two functions, again, e to the i omega t, which we can say is right here, and e to the negative i omega t, which is right here. And we want to use these two functions to try and remain on the imaginary axis, like cancel out all the real components. So if this is the vector describing this point, and this is the vector describing this point, if we were to subtract this vector, or just add the negative vector, just add vector same magnitude but opposite direction, if we were to add that to this vector here, or then we get on this point on the imaginary axis. So we're able to go back to the imaginary axis by taking this vector and in a way subtracting or adding the negative of this vector. And likewise if we do that for all different points we're going to get different points along the imaginary axis. So we can describe this oscillation along the imaginary axis as rotation along one way minus rotation along the other way. And notice that if we want to try and get back our sign, we have to both scale it by dividing by 2, and we have to convert it to being a real number, since this by itself would be purely imaginary. If we want it to be real, we have to divide by i in order for sine to be real, because we know sine's real. So with that, we can see, like, graphically what we mean by, like, this formula here. How these sinusoids are composed of, like, this complex exponential function which describes rotation or circular motion. Now the reason why I belabor all this is because in engineering, like in signal processing, electrical engineering, and if anything relates to like Fourier transforms, they typically regard e to the i omega t as the most elementary function. And the reason why they say that is because they say that this is the only function that has one frequency component. e to the i omega t has one frequency component, omega. e to the negative i omega t has one frequency component, negative omega. But in the complex plane, and in terms of complex exponentials, cosine and sine technically have two frequency components, omega and negative omega. And we know that we need these two frequency components to stay on the real axis and stay on the imaginary axis. So essentially we need these two uh, components, omega and negative omega, in order for these functions to remain real when we're working on the complex plane. Now you may be thinking, okay, but how does cosine and sine have two frequencies? Shouldn't it just have one frequency? It's just cosine omega t. But that's if we think about omega t in the real domain. Does it have one frequency omega? Like if we think of it with just like, if we draw out like a real plot of like x versus t, uh, t, then this would have one frequency. And we defined it as like a, only having a positive frequency because we defined it as just like the number of cycles per second. And we typically wouldn't really have a negative frequency or a negative number of cycles per second. But when we're generalizing it to the complex plane, then, and when we're generalizing and, and contextualizing everything in terms of like this complex exponential, then we say it has two frequency components. And that's a really subtle and tricky like concept to grasp. Essentially, you can think of like cosine and sine, they're real functions, and when we're restricted to the real domain, like when we're talking about physics or whatnot, then we say that only has like one frequency, omega. But when we generalize to like the complex domain and we start talking about signals and different functions, then we say that they have two frequency components, omega and negative omega. And Hopefully I haven't really like confused you with that, but I really want to like point that out. Essentially show how we can describe these functions in terms of like rotations using two uh, frequencies. Yeah. So with that, I'll hopefully see you in the next video.